Dan, I want to talk about an idea that you and I have discussed before, but I think it needs to be discussed in more detail. And that is that the Electrotech, which is on the supply side, uh, it's uh, renewables and batteries, and on the demand side, it's things like EVs and heat pumps. But that technology doesn't just, it's not like you flip a switch and suddenly it displaces all the old uh, fossil tech that's already in the energy system. It takes time. It's a transition. And part of that transition, and, and this is what we're actually in now, is the electrotech is taking all the growth. Once it's done taking 100% of the growth, then it will eat into the existing market share of the fossil tech. Could you explain that in a little more detail, please? Well, it's, a, it's almost a mathematical necessity of the progress of, uh, of a new technology growth, right? If we, uh, I think in a previous uh, chat, we, uh, we talked about the rise of cars in, uh, in, uh, in America or in the world as, as a replacement of the horse. And if you go back to 1910, you can kind of have this free, frozen moment where all of the growth of transport demand is going to cars and horse growth has kind of flattened off. Uh, before that, you know, go 10 years before that, most of the transport growth is coming from horses. In, in 1910, it's mostly then from cars. And then obviously what happens afterwards is that horses go into decline because you get the, the entrance of the car. So it's kind of a mathematical necessity where, where it's, it's, a, it's a signpost that we're at the peak that most of the growth is now going to renewables. And I, I, I've, I hear this sort of, I would say, fossil lobby point quite often that says like, okay, uh, renewables are going to only be additional. All the growth is now going to renewables, but I'm not going to do more. Uh, to, to which my answer is, to what extent do you expect these renewable players to somehow sort of play fair? It's like, oh, no, fair, fair game, right? I, I will not push into your market further because I'm already taking all the growth. Um, Electrotech manufacturers have built capacity that can go much further than the current rollout rates. They are pushing for much larger market shares. Uh, why would they not push out energy that is much more expensive uh, uh, in favor of their electrotech. Yes, and I think there is a focus in the popular narrative that is wrong, and the focus is on supply. How do we supply more energy, you know, through wind turbines and solar panels and battery storage? And when you look at it from that point of view, and of course, the, 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 the fossil advocates will always point to that famous graph showing, you know, from, from 1945, the end of the Second World War to now, where a primary energy demand just goes straight up. And their argument is that all of the new sources of electricity, like natural gas, like, uh, like nukes, all of that just got absorbed by the, the growth in demand. Here's, but here's what's different. It, it, it's not the generation of power with new technologies. It's the use of power with new technologies. We didn't have electric vehicles. We didn't have heat pumps. We didn't have heat batteries and a whole range of other ways to make industrial heat and, and electrify uh, industrial processes. We do now. And those technologies combined with the, the clean electricity are now the cheapest form, the best way to do work in the in the economy. And I think that is the point that gets missed over and over again, is it's the de change in demand side devices that that really uh, electrotech that drives this thing. And it's quite remarkable, right? If we go back, uh, say, 20 years, and we look at what share of the energy system you can electrify, you could probably credibly come up with, I don't know, a, a, a third of the electric energy system could be electrified economically. And maybe another third, if you're really stretching, could be sort of technically electrified. We have solutions, but are not competitive. Now, if we fast forward to today, uh, uh, easily two thirds of the economy can now be, uh, of the energy system can now be electrified, uh, not just technically, but economically electrified. Um, and then we can go back in history and look at what happens when new sectors unlock for electrification, right? So back in the 1910s with machine drives becoming electrified, lighting becoming electrified, this can go very, very quickly. If you have a superior energy service that you can offer through electri electricity and it becomes competitive, we have lots of historical examples how you can see sectors very rapidly within 10, 20, maybe 30 years switching over to electricity. And we just now, you know, over the past four or five years, we just now hit those tipping points on the end demand side where electric vehicles are becoming cost competitive, heat pumps are becoming cost competitive. So all of these technologies are coming in. We're just the, sort of at the, at the start of that. We're now sort of five years into the, that, that, post that tipping point. 
Um, and this can go really quite fast. And, and that's what makes us quite bullish in uh, about electricity demand growth over the coming uh, over the coming decade or two is because we're seeing these new technologies coming in. We've known from history when you get these better, more efficient technologies coming in that are electric, uh, electric technologies and they're becoming cheaper, uh, that change can happen much faster than, than many expect. Uh, and I think that's we're, we're only at the, the start of that S curve today. There's a fallacy out there in the narrative that I want to address, and I'll use uh, Alberta as an example. So Alberta is the Texas of Canada. It produces 4 million barrels of, uh, of oil a day. It's, it's a, a very big oil producer. In fact, you know, Canada is the fourth largest in the world. So it, it, Canada is a player. And the uh, oil advocates in Alberta will say, okay, fine. You know, let's assume that, that you're right, Hislop, and, and, you know, the IEA's APS scenario comes true. And in 2050, there's only 57 million barrels a day of oil demand instead of 103 like we have today. doesn't matter. There's still 57 million barrels of oil. We'll be fine. That, the fallacy there is, is believing that you will are the going to be the last barrel standing that you are the most economic choice the most lowest uh, emission intensity choice that you are the the best choice uh, in the marketplace and all your competitors are just going to fold up their tents and and go home and leave you that market share that's not what happens in in sunset industries uh, competition becomes absolutely rabid and everybody's trying to drive down their costs and main, and become competitive. So you drive, you have too much supply chasing, too a diminishing demand, and and yes, some of the high cost producers will fall off over time, but not before they give it their best shot to stay in the marketplace. And and that is is the fallacy. There just because there's some demand doesn't mean there's high prices. It doesn't mean that it's demand for your product. And, and because Canada and the U.S. Are, are such huge oil and gas producers, they've kind of got this complacent mentality that doesn't matter, we'll be okay. I don't think so. I, so it's it declining markets, completely different dynamics than uh, the perpetual rising markets. I fully agree. I think on top of that is that they're global commodity markets as well, right? So we're not talking about, you know, much brand loyalty where people prefer to get their gasoline from one gas station or another. People are just looking at this as a commodity. It's just the cheapest thing they can get in the market. So it really is all about just being economically competitive. And if you look at the global oil cost curve, it's very clear that when you start talking about halving global oil demand, it's very clear who's going to lose there. And it's it's very, very clear that the Middle East only stands to, well, not stands to gain, obviously, prices will fall, but they, they have, of course, the better economic deal in the world. And for the rest, uh, like Canadian producers, American producers, European producers, it's going to be very hard, very, very hard to compete here on this global market. Um, and, and I think another point, a point that you made, which is quite interesting is, um, how many people in a global commodity market in decline, how many actors does it take to spoil the market? It doesn't even need to be that all oil majors are going in the wrong direction. Shell might have a very good unwinding plan, as is BP and maybe Exxon and maybe maybe even OPEC. I don't know what, what, uh, what kind of unwinding plan they have. But it might only take a couple of actors that overinvested and they now need to desperately earn some money back just on the margin. They won't make their project money back, but just on the margin to stay alive. They can flood the market and actually spoil a lot of the fossil profitability. And we're seeing this now starting to play out with LNG, right? We see these warnings now from Shell and from Exxon saying, guys, can we please slow it down with the LNG export capacity out of Texas? Because you're kind of ruining the market for all of us. Because when you build that overcapacity and you flood the market, I also suffer because I also need to lower my prices. I also don't no longer get my money back on my project. And so this is, I think at the moment, I don't have much certainty of where this is going, but I see it with LNG taking shape at the moment that um, there's this overinvestment and it only takes a couple of people overinvesting a couple of mega projects to spoil the whole market for years and years and years. And I think this should be, this is probably what I expect what keeps up the oil majors at night is not so much that their own plans might not be adequate, because of, of course every oil company will think their plans are adequate, but it's a prisoner's dilemma. Are the other companies actually also having adequate unwinding plans? And it only takes one or two or three other companies to have you know, wrong-headed plans in perpetual growth for this market uh, price, repricing to be really painful for everyone. 
Yeah, and and to tie this back into the, per, the theme of this interview, we started out talking about how uh, renewables and particularly electrotech first take all the 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 demand growth. Then, once they hit a hundred percent of demand growth, they start uh, taking the market share of the existing fossil tech. And the issue here is that if you, the, I I came across a a, a Reuters column. Uh, oh, six, eight months ago, where the columnist was saying, watch what the super major, the oil super majors are doing, because they're all exiting long cycle, high cost fields. And they're crowding into fields like in Guyana, for example, that have a $30 a barrel break even, because they know what's coming. And they're going to be as competitive as long as they can. And so they have, it's not so much a unwinding strategy as it is managed decline. As the market declines, they, this is how they will remain a player as long as possible, a profitable player. And, and far too often, you know, policymakers and, and industry leaders, and we see this in Alberta, like in spades, they get all caught up in narratives like OPEC, where there's just going to be, oh, there'll be growth out in 2050, you know, expand your pipelines, expand your, your production. The smart money is already heading towards the exits. Yes, I mean, you can also see it in the, the annual reporting of the IEA of where big oil companies are spending their profits, right? Is uh, When we go back 10 years ago, the majority of profits is reinvested into capital outlay for new oil and gas projects. Over the past couple of years, it's mostly dividends and share buybacks that you that oil companies put their money into, right? To prop up share prices rather than to actually increase production. Uh, there are fewer opportunities. I think many people behind the scenes at these large oil companies also realize that we're, you know, on this plateau of demand right now, and and we will go into decline uh, 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 over the next, you know, five to ten years. I think most uh, realize that. And so whilst on the outside, we might see from these oil companies in, 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 in the public a lot of bullishness and uh, uh, fossil fuel forever growth uh, narrative. I think behind the scenes, these are very clever people. They know what is coming. They also look at the same data that we do. Um, and they also realize that they need to reorient themselves within this market before it's too late. And so I think that's what we're seeing at the moment happening is, is you, you keep, I mean, it's exactly like a financial organization talking your book. Once you realize you're in a bubble, you keep the bubble alive for as long as, as possible to offload your own assets into the market. Uh, and once you're offloaded, then all of a sudden you say, like, actually, guys, it's a bubble. Let's not do this. Um, uh, which, again, is, for instance, LNG quite interesting that we're seeing uh, even oil companies now talking about an LNG bubble, uh, uh, starting to talk about an LNG bubble, which might actually be an indication that they've offloaded their assets where they were uncomfortable with. And once they've offloaded it, they now start talking uh, uh, bubble. Uh, an observation from Canada, because uh, we're talking about, I mean, Prime Minister Mark Carney, who uh, everyone knows has been kind of the climate finance guy for the last decade, right? He's, he's got an international reputation. He became Premier, Prime Minister, sorry, back in the spring. Then he won an election and now he came in. He, he's got this big, big projects mentality. We're going to turn away from Trump in the US. We're going to reorient the Canadian economy to Asia and Europe. And we're going to build these big projects like ports and mines and, and so on. There, he's also talking about making Canada an energy superpower in both conventional and renewable energy. Now, this is interesting because that particular narrative, which is extraordinarily powerful in Canada because the corporate media amplify it all the time, is not based on data. It's not based on evidence. It's based on narrative. It's talking points. And I read op-eds and I interview people all the time. And if you push them just a little bit, what's the data behind your, you know, behind your bullish comments? It's the OPEC modeling. It's the Exxon Mobil modeling. It's the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which, you know, I mean, the United States is the biggest oil producer in the world. They're not going to be bearish on oil. They're bullish on oil. And it's, it's not the cautious modeling, it's the bullish, over-optimistic modeling that informs their narrative, and that's all they run with. And so, the, and again, to get back to the theme of this interview, as electrotech and renewables eat more and more demand and hit 100%, and 
what you're seeing in the oil industry and the gas industry are responses to that. And, and some are, some deny it. Some like the oil majors are, are, you know, very quietly preparing for it. Uh, but the fact that the smart money is preparing for it is a huge message to the rest of us. Two thirds of capital outlay in energy now in electrotech, only one third in fossil tech. That used to be the other way around uh, just a few year, years back. Uh, it's, uh, it's people are preparing for this behind the scenes. Uh, it's uh, currently not apparently not politically beneficial for many people to say this. But that it's it's the it's a view into the future. You just look at the capital outlay. You look at indeed where the smart money is going, not the speculative money. Uh, but and smart money is increasingly going towards electrotech. Um, and that's an indication, right? So I think also for, for people that are listening and, and generally I, I encourage people, you know, don't look at the modeling, don't look at like what, of course, oil companies talk their own book, uh, electrotech companies will also talk their own book. Just look at the data. This is why at Ember we have these open data platforms where people can go in and just look at the data yourself, understand yourself. Hey, if this is the trend over the past 15 years, what do I expect the next five years to look like? Um, uh, do a little bit of your own research by diving into the uh, f fundamental data behind this transition. Uh, and don't just take whatever people tell you because everyone will talk their own book on both sides of this. Uh, and so uh, the only way to get to the truth here is to, to investigate the foundational facts. That is excellent advice. Uh, viewers, I would suggest you take Dan's advice. And you can find uh, Ember Energy. You can search it on Google. You'll find it very quickly. They've got loads of great data. Dan, uh, another fascinating interview. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, Markham.